Michixis, everyone. Welcome to First Foods. Um, we are just going to get started now. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok Two Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory here in Colorado. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to First Foods. I am the program director. My name is Brooke Rodriguez. I'm a Taino mother living in Matinecock territory, New York. Um, just wanted to, again, just welcome everybody back as we do uh, every week. We're going to go over some housekeeping items and some protocols. And lastly, a disclaimer. So our first protocol. Is a land acknowledgement. So we recognize, uphold, and respect Native nations and their lifeways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island in Aviala. Everyone attending this space must uphold the same anti-colonial solidarity. Native knowledge. Lessons learned are not for non-Natives to monetize on or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest teachers in our programming. Just reminding everybody that this is an intertribal space. So please remember that they, um, that we all have come from different nations and regions. So what may be odd or undesirable as food may be good or proper in another person's uh, cultural tradition. Respect that and don't insult or belittle. Respect tribal food, land and medicine sovereignty. Remember that the majority of foods are shared by many different tribes, but with different names. Do not try to claim exclusivity or copyright for your own people. It's okay to share the name you know as it is. It is not okay to create dissent over a, a different name, no dissent over blood quantum or otherwise more Indianer than you fighting. Foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. The medicines in traditional communities may be seasonal or may be being left to replenish themselves. And also because we're in a space that is you know, for indigenous people, we have to, have to always practice consent and respect when indigenous people say no. Food sovereignty. First people have the rights to hunt, fish, forage, harvest, and grow on their traditional territories. It is unacceptable, especially as a non-native, to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles. And lastly, our disclaimer, First Foods is for educational purposes before using, ingesting, or any herb or plant that you learn about for medicinal culinary purposes, please consult a physician, medical herbalist, or suitable professional. And for indigenous community members, um, just remember to consult your medicine people, your grandmothers, your aunties, your community for the proper ways on how to either harvest or consume or um, plant your traditional species of animals and plants. Yeah, thank you, Brooke. So everyone, welcome to First Foods. This is a program led by and made for indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical knowledge available from the culture bears that hold the oldest knowledge on the continent something so many of us need at this time. So today um, we are uh, having Josephine A. Smith teach us gathering and preserving our coastal foods. Josephine Smith is an enrolled citizen of the Shinnecock Indian Nation of um, Eastern Long Island, New York. She resides on the Shinnecock territory with her family. Josephine began foraging and cooking at a young age, watching her mother, grandmother, and aunts and uncles. As she became an adult, she continued her interest learning about the traditional foods and medicines of her people and passes this knowledge on to her children and grandchildren. For over 25 years, she's developed recipes and sold her food as a vendor at powwows. She's given presentations on traditional foods and has catered special event receptions for museums and cultural organizations. 
Josephine also serves as the Director of Cultural Resources Development for the Shinnecock Nation and owns her own business as a jewelry, craft, and regalia designer. Although no longer able to travel to powwows as a food vendor, she still enjoys gathering from the land and sea and cooking for family and friends. Thank you so much, Josephine, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Ah, thank you. Um, hope everyone can see me good. This is my first time actually doing a Zoom class, so forgive me for anything, a background. Um, Nui Sawank, Josephine Smith, I am Pamishuan. I come from the Shinnecock Nation. I have lived here my whole adult life. I lived in Brooklyn as a child, but Shinnecock was always home. We always came to the reservation um, vacations, long weekends, summer, anytime grandma, auntie was sick, we were home. Um, so I have always been close to the land here and to the waters here. As a young child, my mom would walk us to go visit our aunties and cousins and, you know, pointing out along the roads when we went, you know, this is a um, mustard plant and we use this for X, Y, and Z and, you know, all the different things and different medicine plants she would pick out to us. Some of my fondest memories was going blackberry picking right across the road from my grandma's house was a uh, nice long path. And first thing we would do is in the summer would to go up that path and see who could get the most blackberries and take it home. We'd have big baskets of back blackberries and, and have um, blackberries on our cornflakes for breakfast and blackberry slump for lunch or dinner or dessert at nighttime. And the blackberry slump was a boiled berry um, that was sweetened and then you made a dumpling to go in that. So it was like a, a berry stew almost. Um, and so it was, you know, that I guess that maybe started my wanting to cook and, and wanting to enjoy foods more as, as I was taught. Um, also, another childhood memory that really made me interested in the foods and all. Um, we used to have our uncles would go hunting or get from other hunters. And in the wintertime, we would have a, a big um, uh, harvest dinner like. Um, from the hunt. So we would have uh, rabbit and goose and duck, um, deer meat, venison. And my um, auntie would make a uh, grape ketchup from the wild grapes and put on the food. So it was, um, you know, we just grew up around food. Uh, my mom and aunties make big pots of the succotash or the clam chowder that was then taken down to the powwow grounds for them to sell at the powwow. Um, and the money from that went to the tribe and to the church. So food has always been a part of my life and in, in my um, home when we lived in, in as children in the city, mom would still cook some of our traditional foods, uh, the succotash made from the beans and the corn and it's a sap. All, all of these foods were things that just brought my interest to food. Um, and so I continued to, to cook, continue to um, teach my children, my grandchildren, and continue to go and forage. I'm going to start the uh, PowerPoint. Oh, oh, hang on a minute. I think I just made a mistake there. Uh, okay, share screen up. Hopefully it's going to come up. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is um, my grandson out fishing right out in the the waters off of our off of our territory. This is out in Shinnecock Bay. We are surrounded by the. The, we're a peninsula where our territory is right now, but all of Long Island is surrounded by water. So everything is coastal for us. And of the tides, when we can go clamming, when we can uh, go fishing, everything is determined of course by the moon. So we thank grandmother moon 
for giving us these cycles for which we know to go and, and hunt, to fish, to gather our foods at certain times and how it affects the growing cycle as well as the women's cycle. So gathering from the sea, these are just some things, the clams, the quahogs, which are the hard shell clams, there's a oyster shell and the oysters and the mussels. And these are just some, uh, we also have uh, scallops that we find out in the waters off of our coast. Crabs. And then there's the different types of seaweed. You have the kelp, you have the sea lettuce. And then we have different types of fish. So this is a, a rack that shows a fish that would be drying. And then on this rack is where we would smoke the fish. We also do a lot of gathering of the berries and we, we uh, eat the berries when they're fresh and we eat them when, and we dry them also. And we could dry the berries and then mix those in. So drying the foods would be done, especially the berries, you could just lay them out in the sun to dry or put them in a woven bag and hang that up in a dry place. And then of course we can save the seeds. Now these are dewberries that you're seeing on the screen now that were gathered a little while ago today. And they're very similar to the blackberries. Blackberries um, are, grow a little higher and they are bigger. These are huckleberries. So the differences between huckleberries and blueberries is the size, a little bit of sweetness and the color of the berries um, and how you distinguish. They look almost alike when you're in the woods to gather. Um, but we have the huckleberries, as you can see, are very shiny and they're small and very dark. The blueberries have more of a, a white coating on them almost. It looks almost like white powder is on them sometimes and they are larger. And another way to distinguish when you're picking, if you didn't know that, taking the, the back of the leaf, if you rubbed it on a piece of paper, the huckleberries leave a, a yellow um, residue behind. These are, many times we say that these are raspberries, but there actually was an introduced plant. These are, um, they're now called wine berries or bramble berries, but these grow plentiful all over the reservation. Here we have uh, beach plums that have not um, ripened yet. They usually ripen in another month or so. And we have wild grapes here. So these will get uh, dark, they're green now, and these will get uh, almost black, and dark purple and black. And um, this is the, the grape that we would gather. And um, as I was talking about the grape ketchup, I used to make and can the, um, uh, make it more like a thick jelly, but spiced it up with uh, nutmeg or cinnamon and would put that on homemade bread or on the meat. It's really good on wild game, any type of wild game. The grape leaves are also, uh, you can cook in the grape leaves and you can also use that for medicine. This is a photo of a smoker being built. And you can see here, I can't see it too clearly here, but he's putting the, the four sides up on that. And this is a drying rack. So hanging from the drying rack, um, we can take slices of pumpkins or any type of squash and you could hang those 
um, to dry. You can also dry beans uh, uh, that you could hang the beans. Uh, many times you would braid the ears of the husk from the ears of corn and you could hang those. This is a, a drying rack. Okay. So those are just some of the, the things that we gather and some of the um, structures that we use for drying our foods. And of course, today there are uh, modern ways to dry our foods. You can get a dehydrator, you can uh, sun dry by putting the foods just laying out. Maybe you would use a screen or a net and put that down so it would stay dry. Um, you can put your food in the oven on a baking sheet to dry food. So you can slice your, your, uh, your any of your vegetables or uh, peaches, plums, and put those on a rack and put them in the oven in low temperature and dry those. Um, we also have um, the, for smoking, you can go and get a modern day smoker or you, you can go to the store and buy and sometimes those are very expensive. So an inexpensive way to make a smoker that's not a rack is to um, just get a, a old barrel. Um, sometimes you find those 55 gallon drums that are clean or a metal garbage can and you can put, um, rods across that or sticks across that and you can hang your fish or hang your meat to dry over that and it's almost like making jerky. You can season it. Um, you can use the berries. We use juniper berries a lot for seasoning and, and helping with preserving the foods um, and the juniper comes from the red cedar trees that we have and they're plentiful out here. So those are, are a few of the methods that we use. Um, and this all goes to our food sovereignty. You know, um, those words you hear a lot of today, you hear about food sovereignty and, and what does that mean? Um, what is uh, food sustainability? What is cultural sustainability? And for us, that means that we are able to maintain these things that I just talked about, being able to have the land and the access to the lands and the waters to, so that we can continue our traditions, so that we can continue to feed ourselves, to feed our people, to teach our children where to go. If we don't have that access and, and for us here, a lot of times that access has been stopped. You know, no, you can't go park down to the ocean. You know, no, you can't go park a certain place or no L wiving. I, I drove through an area that said no L wiving, which is a type of fish that we would gather. It's like, wow, how, how can they stop that? Now, yes, we do maintain certain hunting and fishing rights. But even that is challenged sometimes. We have tribal members who are in court cases because of how they are capturing some of the, the eels. Um, eels was another food that we smoked also. And they were getting that for their own economic sustainability by being able to get the, the young eels and then sell them. And then they got stopped by the DEC. So there's so many different factors um, that sometimes are those obstacles to having food sovereignty, to having food sustainability, to having cultural sustainability. When we lose our areas to go to, you know, we lose part of our language if we don't get to go to that area that's a gathering place. Um, there are towns, you know, places now that are towns that are from the, the indigenous words, the Algonquin language here, Sagaponic. Well, that's where the, the ground nuts are at, the Sagapon. But will people know that if you can't go there, if the ground nuts are not growing there anymore because of development? 
um, you won't know to go to a certain area where you gather the LY, you won't know all of these different things and what it means anymore if everything has become developed. So it's important that we try to maintain and get back our lands and our waterways for keeping ourselves strong, for helping to sustain our culture. Um, you can break in at any time if anyone has some questions, but I just wanna say, I think that, that those are things that are very important to us um, that we need to, to remember as we're teaching others, as other people are looking in on us and saying, well, what's that mean? You know, what's food sovereignty all about? What's sustainability? Why is that important? Well, it is important to us as a, as a people, someone just said, and you're making me hungry. <laughs> I should have had a bowl of, of something to show you. Actually, I have some corn soup I just made this week. That was from some of the Haudenosaunee, uh, the, the white Iroquois corn that we got from uh, some Oneida friends. So um, like so this is something we do all the time, you know, going fishing and going clamming and and food exchanges. Um, we've done food exchanges. Our environmental department has done uh, food exchange and getting the, the corn from Haudenosaunee people and giving them clams, giving them oysters. Um, we had an oyster project that was affected from the brown tie from pollutions and algae and all a number of years ago and it's being rebuilt. It's, um, we're working on getting that to be a uh, more sustainable um, uh, program again uh, and build it up and hopefully it won't, uh, we won't have the politics that affected the, uh, the, the uh, other shellfish hatchery that we had. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there, there, there's so many issues that we can talk about regarding food and, and what's important and preserving. It's about preserving the foods itself and it's about preserving the knowledge um, and, and relearning the knowledge. Just like we have language revitalization programs, it's, you know, relearning some of those ancient ways. You know, we're all staying home right now. Everybody's in quarantine almost, you know, with this COVID going on and it's important and it gives us time to go and forage again. It gives us time to get up in the morning because now you don't have to rush and get dressed and put on your makeup and run off to work and drive to work. Well, I have time to get up and, and go out and take a walk at 5.30 or 6.30 or 7.30 or eight o'clock in the morning and still be ready for work at nine, but I don't have to, you know, get in my car and go somewhere or um, like many people would have to do. So it's, um, I think that we, these things are what's important and it's a time I believe creator is telling us is the things happen for a reason and creator is telling us to slow down, creator is telling us to get up and that when the sun comes up and give our prayers of thanks. You know, when we go and we, we forage, we try to remember to take the tobacco and, and say a prayer. And if, if we don't have our tobacco with us to say a prayer of thanks that we're able to gather that food um, or gather that medicine. We, um, you know, we, you can pray and go back to that place if you didn't go, you know, do that ceremony that we're supposed to do when we gather. But we can always say those prayers of thanks every morning and, and thank Creator for giving us these gifts because that's what I truly believe they are, that they are gifts from the Creator and the ability to gather the foods, the ability to gather from the sea is so important to us. Our people were whalers um, and we ended up teaching the colonists when they came how to go and capture the whales when they came close to shore. We used uh, dugout canoes 
um, is how our people would go and whale. They would go up on the, the hilltops and they could see the whales coming and they would signal for everyone to come and they would get in the, the long uh, dugout canoe boats and go and harpoon the whales. And the colonists saw our whaling skills. And then when they were uh, going whaling on their, their ships, when all over the world, our people became captains on, on the whaling ships because of the skill that we had. But those whales that we use for food and for ceremony, they were abused because the the um, the colonists the, they would go out just to get it for the oils, just for the sales. So the whale oil, they just kill the whales and kill the whales for the oil that was used for electricity, for lights, it didn't have electricity. But once electricity was introduced, then everything kind of stopped. And then that affected the people. It affected our people of how they were able to maintain for their families because they would get paid even though they got a minimal amount of, of payment or trade that was one way that they helped their families. And then with the colonists, the whaling industry had stopped, but at the same time, they were taking away our lands. So what we once had, our territory that we once were able to share with the other native people of Long Island, that territory started to shrink because of the development and the stealing of the lands from the colonists. So it's, uh, it's important that we try to see what we have, what we still have access to, that we try to gain access to more and so that we can maintain this healthy way of life because it is through the these gifts that we are able to be healthy. All of our medicines, everything is there for us. We just have to remember, pray, and learn from one another of how to continue to go forward. Thank you, Josephine. Um, I have a question, if if I may. Sure. Sure. Um, what do you think? And this is one of the things I know. Um, I think I saw Christina is in here. I was hoping we could talk about this on the panel that's at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there's such a thing as ethical consumption? like of medicines, of foods, and how, like when you, I've just been really thinking about the concept of ethical consumption a lot lately, I suppose. And I wonder what you think when you hear that. I think for ethical consumption, and I really haven't heard that term, um, but I mean, ethics, what does that mean? That means doing something in a good way, doing something in a right way. So that means not clear cutting lands for cattle to roam, you know, um, not overfishing, you know, uh, making sure that when you go to pick your berries, when you go to, to get whatever plants you need for foods or medicines, that you make sure that there's another plant of the same type there also. You don't take from that first one that you see you take from the others because you always want to make sure that it continues growing. So I think that's, um, to me, that's what ethical consumption is about. It's about thinking about what we do, what we eat, how we gather before eating those food, before taking from the land and from the food. Um, I think when, you know, we have to make sure that the modern things that we do are 
in line with the values that were passed down to us. Um, to me, I think that's what ethical consumption you know, should mean. Yeah, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, or, you know, anything that you'd like to talk with Josephine about? I know I personally am interested in this dryer that you made over the fire and you said you were drying pumpkin? Oh, that you can dry, um, use any type of a drying rack. So that was made like a lean-to. And you can, um, one way to dry fruits like that is to slice them is a way that you can dry the pumpkin because we all know, you know, if you get a pumpkin Halloween and then it just shrinks in and, and, and dies, right? So if you cut it into slices and tie it, um, you know, traditionally you would use uh, twines from the, the um, inner bark of trees or, or from the, the different plants that, that grow, milkweed and, and different plants, um, hemp, um, to make your twine out of or roots. Um, but the, um, it, it's easy just to, you know, now you could just make a lean to like that and, and use some string and hang your, your, uh, fruit slices that way and vegetable slices that way. So does that mean that the pumpkin or whatever it is that you're drying gets a different smoky smell to it also like no because you're drying that that's being dried in the sun um or you could do it's a low fire it wouldn't be the same as um when you're smoking fish say or smoking meat um the other type of smoker um i was going to be outside and then uh, my cousins next to me, they've got a little gathering. So there was a lot of talking going on because I was going to show you the, the uh, smoker that we had um, and that my grandson built for, for this for us. But, um, you know, to, to make that type of smoker, you can um, either use uh, like you can, there's different ways of doing it. You could do a tripod. Um, we had some friends from um, up north, up in northern Canada came one time and they made one um, like a tripod, almost shaped like a teepee, but just using uh, about three uh, long sticks, long branches. We use cedar and then you make, um, so it, it, it's almost like a little square in the center of that. And then you can make a, you can, modern times, you can just put a screen on it or you can take uh, small branches and weave those together so it's almost like a little uh, grill and you can put your your foods on that to to smoke um, the other one is made and this you find amongst many um, eastern woodland people uh, this area in new england area um, you can use uh, fort four fort uh, branches or just lash the um, branches together um, and make like a square almost or a rectangle more and then make cross sticks across that. And then you can either lay your, your fish on that to dry or, um, or you can hang them to dry. Let me see if I could go back. Oh, sorry, I just popped out of that. Um, Back to that other screen. Yeah. Again, this is the uh, this is the one where you can hang, and then let's see, let's see, let's see, six. Trying to find the other one, and this you can see where you have the fish laying across on on the top, and the fire is on would be underneath. And the types of wood that you use um, helps to give the impart the flavor of that. Okay, hang on one minute. Yeah, I don't need that. Okay, and. Um, 
so like um, I like to to use uh, shad tree, the shad or juneberry or service berry, it's called. I like to smoke using that, a mixture of that and cherry. Um, it just gave a good flavor when I would smoke bluefish. I love smoked bluefish. And that was um, one of the combinations of wood that I like to use. But, you know, you can use different hardwoods, never use pine, you know, never use poplar uh, for smoking. Um, you know, cedar. You, um, there's other ways also of putting the fish by the fire. If you don't build a rack over it, you can put the stick uh, through the fish and, and have that leaning up um, near the fire. So um, that's, that's another way of, of smoking the meat. Um, just some. So uh, Alicia, she said, I've been foraging dewberries in Georgia thinking they were blackberries. So you just <laughs> helped out somebody. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, we, it takes us a minute to figure out or we have to go and look up something. Like I said, we're all learning. You know, we all continually are, are learning. We learn from our elders, then we forget. <laughs> we learn, you know, as an elder and then we forget. <laughs> and so, um, so it's it's all a learning process for all of us, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's a combination of learning from one another, learning from family, learning what's been passed on, and and book knowledge also. Sometimes it, you know, we need to make sure that we're picking the right thing, you know. So we don't want to, there are many many plants that look alike, you know. You want to make sure. And you need to know what time to gather certain plants. Like you might read, oh, you can't eat pulk, but you can have, you can gather that when it's at a uh, very young leaf. You know, what's the best time to dig a root? What's, you know, you want to dig when the plant isn't um, in its growing stage. So you're not uh, killing the plant at that time, you know, when you're, you're getting different, um, uh, uh, like the dandelion or the plant and different, different things. So, I mean, we're blessed here. We are truly, Creator truly blessed us where we live. Um, we have so, so many um, plants here, so much wildlife, so many, here. we have uh, wild turkey, we have uh, which have just been like reintroduced out to the East End because they were plentiful at one point and then there was overkill. Um, we have ducks, we have geese. Um, pheasants were introduced, they uh, had come from Europe. At one time they were plentiful and now not so much. We don't hear and see them um, as much as we used to. Rabbits are still plentiful. Um, some people eat squirrel, um, like I said, lots of deer, so lots of venison. Uh, we like to, to prepare our foods in, in different ways. Some things we do in a traditional way uh, and some things, you know, we're living in a modern world, so it's easier to throw it in the oven. Um, but there's nothing like the, the taste of food sometimes when you get to gather it fresh, when you get to, you know, just put it out on the grill, out on the fire. You know, we have a fire pit in my my yard and, you know, the kids will go clamming or I'll go clamming and we just come home and put it in the fire sometimes and eat it that way or just let it pop over and burp them up. So, <laughs> you know, these are things that I'm, I'm happy that my grandchildren like to do. I'm happy that my, you know, that, they are carrying on those traditions. So, mm -hmm. Josephine. Yes. Um, can you talk to us about gathering clams? I know that that's something all the way on the other coast from you that I'm interested in learning about for my cultural and food heritage. Mm -hmm. um, but I have no experience and I'm an urban native. So can you, like, 
can you just tell us about clams, please? Well, I don't know if I know they have my sister talks about the gooey duck clams out on the West Coast there. She's up in Hoopla up in Northern California. Um, but I do know that she was excited when she went to, uh, I think she was at the market one day and, and uh, someone asked for quahogs and she flipped around and said, where are you from? How do you know that word? <laughs> Which is a quahog is a hard shell clam. And um, she found out that the, the people up there, I think it's the Yorok people that they speak um, Algonquin that their language is Algonquin language. So she was real excited about hearing that. But I know she also talks about they have gooey duck clams out there, which I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> I think they're just big. Um, but when we go clamming, we go into the water and just feel around with our feet. We wait till it's low tide. This is the best time to go when it's low tide and we walk out and we just feel with our feet, you know. You know, and sometimes when the, the babies are born and they get long toes and we say, oh, they got good clam digger feet <laughs> to feel the, you just can feel it, you know, sometimes you, and then you just bend down and scoop it up and you see, well, is it a rock or is it a clam? And most of the time you can feel with your feet if it's a clam or not. And then sometimes they'll try to move under the sand or in the mud away from you. Um, so, but that's one of the ways that, that we gather is just using our feet. Other people use a rake, use, um, there are clam rakes. Um, so the, um, you can just scrape the bottom of the, the sand, you know, scrape the bottom of the bay where you're clamming at to get those. And there are all types of clams is the, the quahog, the hard shell clam. Um, and there are like different sizes of those. You have the, the um, what they call little necks, which are maybe about oh, two inches, three inches um, big. And then you have the cherry stone size, which is three to four. And then you have the quahogs, which are like five inches um, big. Um, and those are tougher. Um, the meat is, is a little tougher. So those are good for, they call them chowders because they're good for cutting up to use when you're making your, your chowder. But we use clams in all kinds of ways. Um, cut them up and put it in, um, when you're making pancakes, we make uh, clam cakes or, or you can uh, take that batter and fry it and make a fritter. Um, sometimes we call uh, clam cakes, uh, clam fritters but they're actually a fritter is more of a little rounded uh, ball that's put in the grease to, to fry. Um, but the others, we the clam cakes, um, we just cook them, um, put it in pancake batter, use the juice from the clam in there and it's delicious. Sometimes you can chop up onion, you can use the wild onions and chop a little green onion in it. Um, uh, we cook clams, like I said, all kinds of ways, baked, stuffed, raw, uh, on the grill. Um, we make a clam pie that we make a stew out of potatoes and onions. And um, sometimes you put salt pork in it and um, a little seasoning in it, uh, thyme or hot sauce. And you stew that up with your clams and you, you don't add your clams until the last minute most of the time, you know, right before you use the juice to get all the flavors and simmer that. And then you add your clams because when you, you don't want to overcook your clams because then they become rubbery. So, you know, you have to be careful of how you're cooking your foods. And then with that, uh, after we make that stew, then we cover it over with like a, um, biscuit crust, a baking powder crust, baking powder biscuit crust, and we bake that. So that's one of the, the foods that is traditional to Shinnecock that we love to, to um, cook here. Um, you know, traditional in, in modern times, is, you know, um, after the introduction of, of flour and ovens and all. Um, some of the traditional methods that were used before for cooking the soups or stews and all was in the clay pots. We made clay pots and you put those pots um, in the fire pit 
and we'll put the sticks around it. Uh, a lot of our pots were pointed ends, and that was one way of, of cooking uh, the food. Um, so good luck with clamming. All kinds of recipes are out there for, for good eating. And but, I, oh, you know. if, if I could, I'd, I'd like to sort of get a ask question right here. Something that you said, Josephine, just really, um, I don't know, it just grabbed me and it was, it was your uh, uh, statement about what is food sovereignty? What is it? And, and I, I perked right up because I thought I had a handle on what true food sovereignty is, but it never, ever, ever, I never thought of it in a, like you addressed it. So, true sovereignty, food sovereignty, means that you have access to land and water. And, um, and, that, and then you talked about the hunting and fishing, right? If you, if you have some of those, preserve them, fight for them, make sure you can hang on to those and expand, expand those rights. And I think that's, I think that's wonderful. Um, but I wanted to ask this question about clamming because of Desiree's remark. I know you were recently out by Puget Sound, right, Desiree, were you? So yeah. what I heard, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the tribe, Josephine, so you might know. And also, I don't remember if it was clams or oysters, but I'm pretty sure it was clams. Anyway, the, the tribe that was in that area around Puget Sound had great success with clams. Clam beds, is that what they're called? And mm -hmm. then, so who came in? The colonials came in and took over so they could market them. Well, they destroyed, they destroyed that, that population of clams down to almost near extinction. But when they were done, what did they do? They told the, they told the, the tribe, oh, you can have it now, you know, um, because they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with it. Do you know that those tribes, they knew the song, they knew the words, they knew how to care for them, and they brought them back, and they brought them back strong. So this, you know, this, uh, there's so much to be said for when you're gathering, offer your prayers, offer the tree medicine, you know, whatever medicine, you know, I know that I like to always um, say that if you pick something, especially when you're, you're picking your, um, your uh, willow bark, if you're in a willow, willow bark for the uh, uh, chinupa, that you, you gather that. And but we like to smudge it down first, and then when we're ready to cut that, we take because we bring water to offer, and and so we take some of that water, pour it on the plant, pour it into the abalone shell, and make it into a paste. And when we take the cuttings, we doctor that plant. We mm. doctor that plant with the paste that we just made. And we give thanks, you know, uh, for, for their offering so that we can survive. That's what I know about our people of all nations. We know how to do these things. And they, you know, they wonder why, um, nobody needs to wonder why the world is a mess because they, they take so much and they give, they give almost nothing back. But I thought, I just love that. And, and then, um, I suppose this may sound like a very, <laughs> Uh, separate thoughts, but that's how I'm working today. I just came from an uh, outdoor meeting in the hot sun b before I got here. Um, I'd like to always look, Josephine, for the uh, samenesses in different cultures. And my father was from the Philippine Islands. My mother is Lakota from the Rosebud Reservation. Well, when I was over in the Philippine Islands, it's like... Um, uh, my father and had a lot of relatives that lived down by the, I think it's called the China Sea. And you could see the fishermen out there repairing these long nets, getting ready for the, the catch of the day. And uh, in the morning, I, you know, I, I'm an early riser. I would wake up at six o'clock and there would already be somebody knocking at the door. 
and it were it was the fisher people and the, the fish that they were offering to sell were still flopping in the basket you know talk about fresh delivery that was incredible but then we have they have celebrations like um lechons which are like large feasts or lechonadas which are small feasts if it's a large feast we roast we roast the fish uh and we uh, smoke the fish and the, a goat and a pig but if it's a um, that's a lechon that's the big feast the small feast is one or the other give or take that they generally have fish but usually if it's a lechonada no no pig or no goat, just the fish and one or the other. But they dig the pit down into the ground and then they build that platform like a sacred fire and it is sacred. And then they, they, then they put the meat in there and, uh, and then they put seasonings on and then they, they build another, like, like you were pointing out, it just tickled me because I like to look for those things. Mm -hmm. They build, you know, like the wooden, almost a wooden, something across the top of it um, and let it smoke all night long, all mm -hmm. night long, all through the night. And so it's ready for the celebration uh, or the funeral or whatever they, they're prepared for. It's ready the next day. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. So I like to look for those things. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate your presentation today. Everything, uh, many of the things that you said, especially about the, um, knowing the difference between huckleberries and blueberries. I really did used to know the difference in those things when I was a little girl. <laughs> you know, you, you lose, like you said, and that was the biggest thing, you know, how much you uh, can lose um, over all uh, language and, and stories passed down and the, a lot of the knowledge of the foods that can be gathered a lot due to land development over gathering areas. Mm -hmm. Now that was another eye opener for me. I'm so happy for your wisdom. And I'm so happy you're here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and, and for, uh, you know, for sharing your stories also. I think indigenous people all over the world, we, we have that same mindset. We've had those same teachings. And I think that um, that the Wampisha, that some people have forgotten that they became so industrialized, they they forgot what was given to us as as human beings. Um, and I think that that's what is uh, has been missing in in American culture, in in European cultures. I know there are still some uh, European cultures that maintain many of their traditions. Um, the Sam, Sami people, I believe. Um, I've met a few uh, young women from there. Um, so, but it's, it's that loss of indigenous knowledge, um, not passing that down and, and this uh, capitalistic society that we live in, that it's all about the money and what we can build and where we can build it. And it doesn't matter if there's 10 empty houses, we're going to build another 10, um, you know, which makes no sense. Where I'm at, I, we're on Shinnecock territory, but we are surrounded by great wealth. We are surrounded by the Donald Trumps and the Koch brothers and everyone, literally. Um, we're on the east end of Long Island. We're in the Hamptons. If you ever hear about the Hamptons, you know, there's a lot of wealth out here. Um, and there's a lot of development. And I've heard developers speak about, you know, well, we're, you know, we just keep building because the land's there and we can. You're building upon our land that is stolen land. We have tribal members. Um, there was recently a, a video, um, a, a film, a video, a film that was done. It's called Conscious Point. Uh, and one of our, our women who has been an activist her whole life, um, she was the, the main person in that and telling the story of, of her activism and her fighting for the, the land that was stolen because a lot of it is on burial grounds. 
the Shinnecock Hills golf course where Tiger Woods and all these big uh, golfers come. That was part of burial grounds that our people had to help build because that was a way that they had to take care of their families. You know, it, it's that, that area that they want to shut the road off where we would even have access to going through to where there is a known site. You know, the Shinnecock Hills, the college is so much. Um, in 1859 is when the transaction was done that was never ratified. But when we go to court, when we fought it, you know, every time there's always, you know, the wealth, the wealth, the bringing in the railroad, everything is about, about the money. And it's like, oh, well, it's too late. Oh, you didn't fight for it before. No, we've been fighting ever since you got here, <laughs> you know, ever since our, our people met the, the first English settlers um, to this part of Long Island in, in 1640. Um, so we've been fighting for a long, long time we've been trying to hold on to the knowledge that we have left. We've been trying to hold on to some of the language that we have left. And like I said, bring that back. Um, so many people don't um, acknowledge or respect that fact that we have been fighting to maintain who we are, fighting to maintain going and, and getting our our, our gathering rights, our land rights, our fishing rights, our hunting rights, our rights of our people where they are, were left to rest, that are being dug up, that were dug up throughout the years, throughout the early 1900s and late 1800s and all. You know, it, it's a constant, it's a constant fight. So whatever we can do as a people to help one another um, hold on to what we do have and respect one another. I think that's one of the, the big things that people need to acknowledge um, those who have been in contact, have had uh, attempts for assimilation and eradication. You know, we're still here. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've been here, we've been on this land for 10,000 years. Yeah. And, you know, if this is the case, we will be here for 10,000 more. And hopefully we will be able to pass knowledge. Yeah. And survival yeah. knowledge. And that's what food is about. It's about survival. It's about okay. our survival, mm -hmm. the foods and the waters. We can't live without water. We are water. You know, the, the rally cry at, at Standing Rock of water is life, you know. That is so true. Our plants need the water. And, and we have to, even where we're at now, you know, we're in danger because of what has happened with the waters, what's happened with the climate change and the erosion. And that's going on in the Philippines, all over the world, in indigenous communities. You know, not only is our, have our rights been taken of access to the waters, but the actions of people are impacting how we are living and what we can still do. Where I'm at right now, I see I'm not too far from the water and we see the change. We see how the trees that were at the, the marsh are starting to die because of the rising of the, the, uh, the waters. So it's, um, we're living in, in scary times, I guess you might say, but we're living okay. in, in a time that people need to wake up and, and see and help to teach others the importance of taking care of the land, the importance of giving thanks, the importance of helping one another. Um, we have a few, oh, sorry. We have a few comments on the Ah. age that I think are, are kind of really important to what you're talking about with regards to kind of getting back to roots and original instruction. So Stephanie says, I need to barter with you. I love oysters. And then uh, Buck Jones, he says, uh, or they say, be great to establish these trade routes across Indian country. 
And um, I think that that's a pretty um, important comment, you know, establishing trade routes between nations again. Mm -hmm. um, and you had mentioned it earlier that you and the Oneida still do that. And uh, just wondering if you can talk more about that, about having sovereignty between nations and between territories. Um, that was more through our, um, our environmental program um, and they're going to different regional meetings, um, environmental meetings and all. And I don't know how it exactly started with them, but um, they decided to do this uh, uh, food exchange, um, you know, this, this traditional trade. And for a few years now, we've done that you know i've gone out and, and gathered shells or, or you know they might just want the shells or they go and they take home a cooler full of like i said of oysters and, and clams um the environmental department as i said is is bringing back the shellfish hatchery um rebuilding that um we had the first shellfish solar shellfish hatchery in the country back in 1980s um and uh, Christina, when you was talking about um, people out in Puget Sound, um, the uh, Lummi Indian School of Aquaculture, I don't know if it's the Lummi people who you were speaking about, but they have a, a school um, and, and a hatchery out there. And four of our young men went out there in the late 70s and um, in, in, in the 80s and learned from them about how to cultivate the oysters and all and grow them from seed and using the algae and all. They did that um, here. And that's how we uh, received a grant to, to build a solar shellfish hatchery, which, you know, has wow. been going for a while. But then again, you know, like I said, there was some pollution problems. There were problems with the... Um, with the marketing, you know, of a town saying, oh yeah, we'll buy your seed and then not, you know, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so these are all, you know, learning, learning curves as we rebuild again. Well, you know, like you said, the creator knows when it's time. I mean, it's like, it's the creator said it's time for a rest. And so, you know, with the air, they're saying the air gets got a lot cleaner, the waters are a lot better. How is is that helping the the uh, solar hatchery? Is it um, well, the hatchery hasn't been. It, it went into disarray, um, unfortunately. So oh. um, they're working on on uh, rebuilding and getting you know grants and getting funding so that we can rebuild and it can be the viable. Um, tribal enterprise using traditional ways, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that it was, you know, and, and that's yeah, the time yeah. we live in. We have to combine our, our traditional knowledge with the, the modern day academics and, and, um, and, and marketing and everything that is there today, because not everything, unfortunately, can be that traditional trade of right. just going into the sea and, and gathering oysters, you know, we live in a, a uh, society now where you know we need that money to pay the light bills and you know have a car to drive around in and everything so yeah it's, um, you but know, we're working hard on on bringing those way back those ways back I mean it truly is we are think truly in a time of going back to the future yeah because that's what that's what this nation needs this whole turtle island you know I think we're all going back to the future and yeah. and it gives me such pride because it's like you know the the story um, about the 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 tree that was planted, um, and, and and this guy was walking by when this man was planting this beautiful tree, and he said, "What kind of tree is that?" He said, "It's a shade tree, you know, to help with the sun and stuff." He said, "Well, you're never you're never going to be sitting under that shade tree." He said, "Yeah, but the seventh generation well, oh." God, that almost made me cry. <laughs> the seven, and that's what we're doing this stuff for, you know, it's our children, our great grandchildren. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, when yeah. we we're talking about the this time difference and and 
you know, how creator is giving us messages of, of how we need to live again and all. And it's allowing parents to be able to be home. I know some parents, you know, want to get their kids in school or get their kids in camp and I got to get back to work. And, uh, you know, my, my youngest daughter is fortunate. Her and her husband are both teachers at our preschool. They're cultural teachers at our preschool and they have a toddler. And, you know, so she sits there and at home and learning the language and, and uh, they're teaching, doing little skits online that they put online for the, the uh, parents to learn and work with their children on. So it's, um, you know, for some of us, I think we, we do take this time um, that we can learn from it. You know, we're very sad for all those who are, are sick and those who have gone on because of this, uh, this pandemic. But it's, um, it's important that we, we take whatever lessons we can from it and, and teach those ways, you know, I can take my granddaughter, we like I said, we went foraging those pictures, of some of those pictures from the dewberries and the, the uh, huckleberries. And, you know, we just go for a walk in the morning, push her in the stroller and then let her get out. And so this is this plant, this is this plant. Here's the chicory, here's the, you know, you see that purple plant there, that's called chicory. And, you know, we, that's how we learn, you know, this is how we learn and, and, you know, I'm not tech savvy and all, but I'm learning <laughs> a little bit more now. And then, you know, I can use this time to, to put some of that information out for our, our people to, to learn also. Um, I have a couple of more uh, comments. Actually, actually, a lot of comments. So I'm like trying to keep up with them all because this is a very good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so um, we have, Oh, sorry, should I bring it down? So Travis uh, Horse Ankle said, I think it's so amazing that you are still maintaining your food culture after so many years of being exposed to colonization and have, and have the knowledge of the hardwoods and the flora and the fauna around you. So amazing. And then um, Buck Jones says, geoducks are gathered by diving in Pugent Sound area. I might be saying that wrong. And then uh, Andrea, her comment was, I was trying to exercise my food sovereignty in my backyard by planting elderberry, willow, potatoes, squash, and blueberry. The deer really appreciated it. <laughs> yes, I, unfortunately we fight with the deer too sometimes. Who's gonna get out there first? <laughs> she says, I got to harvest some elderberry but last year and this year it looked like it was going to be an abundant harvest until the deer had a harvest of their own. I will not let them deer deter me from trying again. Our four-legged relatives need sustenance as well. Yes, for sure. Um, tell her to try, like they make um, bird netting and you can put that and that kind of helps to keep, sometimes keep some of the, the uh, animals or birds from, from getting to everything. Another thing that's important that we do with, um, with our gathering is remembering to uh, seed save. So that's something that I'm going to be working on more um, is seed saving and, you know, really trying to make sure that we still have some of these things. You know, then it's important too of uh, uh, watching those animals um, that come and eat our foods. Um, watch where they go. Um, I was told, um, I was told by a Lakota man years ago, he said, you know, make sure that you, you know, he said the time's going to come from where we're at, especially on this island, that you may have to move. So watch the squirrels, you know, watch the mice see where they take that seed, see where they take that corn to, see where they take those nuts and see where they bury those in the trees. Um, so that because, you know, you see them go up and they go in the little holes in the trees and all and, uh, and watch those, you know, we have to watch to see what, what's going on. And we, we see things that are coming back and we're observing, you know, different, the different actions of birds, the different actions of the animals. Um, you know, my grandson pointed out to me back in the spring, he said, Graham, he said, there were so many of those black birds flying. I said, they all used to the, the starlings, but they go, you know, there's times when you don't see them gathered that same way. Um, 
the turkey vultures. It was like we hadn't seen turkey vultures in years and the turkey vultures are here and the eagles have come back. It was because of in the, um, I think it was the 1950s when they were spraying that DDT with plants and all that it killed the eagles that were here. We have, the eagles are back in our territory now. So we take these as signs. There hadn't, we hadn't seen or heard about the whales and now the whales have been coming back. Unfortunately, some of them have been being breached and, and coming up on shore because of the, um, the so many boats they see, you know, some of what has happened to them uh, while they're out in the ocean. Um, but uh, when, when the whale came back, like the first time, and I don't know how long that we had heard of a beaching of the whale right uh, across where, where we're at, we're in a peninsula, as I said, so we have the bay and the channel, and then there's the dunes and then the ocean. And that whale beached right across from the area that was closest to the reservation. Um, this was, oh, probably almost 20 years ago now, I guess. Um, I don't know, it's been quite a while. Um, if that, I don't, between 10, 10 years ago or so, more than 10 years, I think it's been. Um, and so our people all went there. We took the kids from the after school program. Everyone went and, and offered prayers and song. And since that time, when the whales are coming back now, we started, we brought back uh, one of the ceremonies and just praying, you know, we, there's some things that you lose knowledge of. And then there's some things that is within you. And you just ask creator that, you hope you're doing things in the right way and to guide you to do those things in the right way. And so we started having ceremonies again um, for when those whales beach. We have a young man that he goes to almost every time he gets that call, he goes there to those whales and, and says a song before those uh, whales are buried or they do the necropsy on them. Um, so that, Traditional knowledge is there. It's, you know, people take things. We're from the East here, but we're um, connected to the people, the Anishinaabe people in the Great Lakes. And their stories say that they came from the East. They came from where the whales were. So it's there. The knowledge is there. And Creator gave each of us a place and each of us knowledge to hold the, the land to hold the, the songs, to hold the stories, to hold the dances, to hold the ceremonies. Um, and we use each other's ways to help bring back our ways. And we learn from one another. We learn from, the, the, uh, from what the plants have to give us. Someone uh, wrote a book, I can't remember her name right now. Um, and it's like if you, I think the title had to do with if you uh, if you listen to the plants, they they will tell you. You know, um, it's a lot about you know just there's so much knowledge that Creator has given us without having this computer, <laughs> without having you know it's just that that earth knowledge and, and that that heart knowledge is is what we need to keep working with and working with one another. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. It's interesting because I know even Bay Area Miwoks, we have whale songs too. So it's just so interesting, like coast to coast, that there's, you know, always a current that runs between us as, as people from different nations. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have, how, many, how many of you have seen that movie called Whale Rider? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a story about the, the New Zealand natives, the Ma Maori. I think the Maori, that. yeah. Maori, yeah. Oh, what a beautiful story. You end up just in tears. You're so happy. Oh. Right, right. It's so funny yeah. you said that because my, my uh, children are watching it last night and my, uh, ah. my uh, grandson's girlfriend, she had never seen it before. Uh, wow. from her family's from Guam. They live up in Washington State. And... Uh, she um, she hadn't seen that movie, so it's funny that wow. she seen that. Yeah, there's a lot. As I said, it's the indigenous people 
our people were well as we traveled all over the world. We have relatives in Tonga. One of our, our whalers, he became a, a magistrate in the, um, the Marshall Islands off of New Zealand. So the people of, of this territory, the, like I said, of Long Island, of New England area tribes, Southern New England tribes, we traveled all over the world and you know, our footprints are there and our families are there. And the, I believe that a lot of it has to do with and people who stayed because they saw some of that similarity. And like you said, uh, the, I, the I love the way you said that our footprints are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. so well, beautiful. Have, we have a couple of uh, questions out of the Facebook group, if I might interject, sure. ask them. Um, so, I thought this was interesting too because folks that I know are thinking about how to plant milkweed for butterflies and things like that to um, reinforce the like con contribution of their gardening to the you know insect world and look out for the bees and the butterflies. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned milkweed twine. Someone asked right. about that in the Facebook group too. Could you t tell us about using milkweed as twine? I know you said hemp. But it's from the right, the hemp and dogbane, uh, milkweed. You can um, gather from the stem. You can uh, gather that inside of that and peel off the outer part and then inside. And then you would, uh, as with any twine, you twist it. If you ever, you know, go to the hardware store and you look at, you know, twine, you, you ask for a roll of twine, it's twisted, it's rolled together. So um, that's how twine is, is made. Um, milkweed is, is used, you know, it's not just a flowering plant that's going to attract bees and butterflies, but it's medicine also. You know, there's so many, so many plants have so many different uses. Um, and it's, it's learning those things safely. Yeah. <laughs> learning what to eat, when to eat it. Like I said, like with pokeweed, you know, you can eat it, but you have to eat it only at a certain time of growth um, that, that you would eat that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of eating, the second question is, do you have any delicious fast recipes and or what's your favorite um, indigenous food of yours that you like to eat and how do you like to eat it? Like I said, I always have my fondest memories was a blackberry slump, <laughs> picking blackberries and you can do it with blueberries, you can do it with any fruit and you boil it down. It's similar to uh, uh, like the Lakota have the wojapi. Mm -hmm. um, it's a boiled fruit. I think they, they, I don't know if they add cornstarch or something to thicken it. Mm -hmm. um, we just boil the berries and add, uh, you can use sugar or maple syrup, whatever type of sweetener, if you want sweetener, agave or whatever in it. Um, and then you make a, a, um, a dough, uh, like, a, like you were making uh, biscuits or dry bread dough and you, especially the biscuit dough because it's, it's uh, softer. And then you drop that into the boiling fruit and then you cover it for uh, 10 minutes and then you uncover it for 10 minutes or, or you, you let it cook for 10 minutes, uncover it and then cover it for 10 minutes and it's done. <laughs> you have a delicious meal out of that. But I like, I like fish. I like clams. I like oysters, I like mussels, I like scallops, I like, you know, all kinds of, of good food. I have a meat allergy now because of the ticks, so I can't eat venison anymore. But I made some, uh, I don't have my photos to share. Um, Wait, that happened to me too. I cannot eat any, any pork, any cow, any beef, any deer. Yeah. I get so sick, but I can still eat seafood and I'm a coastal person myself. So I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping that, um, that I don't get an allergy to seafood. <laughs> oh, that would be awful. Um, Buck Jones, I would like to invite him. Uh, he has like a couple of commentaries and questions. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I, I really appreciate your uh, presentation. Um, I'm from the uh, Monroe Cayuse member from the uh, Pacific Northwest, so we're uh, we're tribal fishermen. 
Mm-hmm. So what you uh, what you talked about is is really important. You know, salmon is is a first food for our people. Um, so we really, uh, you know, we have our songs and our ceremonies um, for the for the fish when they return. You know, um, and these are songs that you know our, our people have been doing since time immemorial. And uh, I really, uh, you know, some of the uh, what you mentioned about land access. Um, that's an issue out here too, you know, it's uh, sometimes we go to gather our, our traditional, our roots and berries and stuff like that. And we have issues, you know, from landowners um, not allowing us on their, on the, on their, uh, on their land where, you know, our elders and our and previous uh, families have went. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing issue. And, uh, um, you know, I know that, uh, uh, our fellow uh, uh, members that are up north of you, the Wampanoags, they they told me at uh, some of the tribal food sovereignty conferences I've attended that they've used some of our treaty, uh, um, some of our Supreme Court cases that have went um, all the way to the Supreme Court um, for access, you know, to go fishing mm-hmm. because you can't be denied, you know, regardless if it's in in your area, the Hamptons or up in the in uh in the Cape, you know you they can't you, you can't be denied because that's our that's our right you know so uh, I I was really uh, uh, when I was at uh, Oneida last year or whatever um, my friend I used to play basketball with him was Wampanoag and he goes yeah Buck we use that uh, we use that uh, Supreme Court case you know to go to go uh, in uh, in Mashpee in that area to get it uh, to go fishing um, so. A lot of what what is being said is uh, is very true, you know. It's uh, we're not looking out for our, uh, you know, my kids or whatever. We're looking out for their their grandkids and, and beyond that. And uh, and I think that uh, in almost any any tribal creation story, food is in is food, food is is mentioned or is a part of that. And and getting tribal food sovereignty back, you know, it. It, it has many forms, you know, um, preserving the preserving the land. It could be you know, used, you know, for marketable. But it, it is a, it is it's a it's a as somebody mentioned, you know, it's a, it's something that we need to we need to keep upholding. And I I'm just really glad I I got onto this uh, this webinar today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you. And the Wampanoags, they're still fighting. I just know uh, recently, um, you know, some of the people up there that I think they had an issue regarding where they were going clamming and being told that they uh, couldn't eat the clams that they wanted to get. And they were like, well, we always have eaten these clams. And they were being told, oh, well, it's polluted. Um, You know, you can't eat that. And they said, well, we know, you know, we're not going to eat the belly. We're only going to eat a certain part of it and, and prepare it a certain way. And I don't know if, you know, if the case got resolved, but I think somebody, you know, almost got arrested or did get arrested because of it, you know, and fighting because it's like, you know, again, we, there's certain things that we know what to do and what not to do, you know, um, even if it it deals with pollution, it's like, just let us be, let us have access. It makes me think of the story um, that you were telling about the whale, you know, how um, they were just killing them for the oil and, and not, you know, and the, and the rest of the poor whale um, wasn't used at all. And that, the, you know, sacrilegious, I hate using that word, but, I, but they, that is. And then think about what they did to the buffalo, you yeah. know, I mean, but that, yeah. And, and that's all that craziness about, um, if you want to destroy your people, uh, destroy their, their food access first. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know? That's exactly. so sad. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's and, another form of, of genocide, you know, when you, abso- take, away, oh, absolutely. When you take away the access, you're, you're, you're killing people mm-hmm. um, and, and you're killing the culture. And that's what they were trying to do, you know, forced assimilation, just like the boarding school, you know, it's forced assimilation take you away from your environment where you can learn these things. Um, so all, all of that is, uh, ah. 
it's ah. the things that we have that we have overcome and that we still have to fight to overcome but you know we're gaining more and, and learning more and, and being able to to use some of the the things from the education um you know turn it back around on them you know turn that turn that back on them like uh, uh buck was just talking about with the the um the rights, the cases for for fishing rights and all, you know, and and the more we can share that knowledge and you know it's like oh you said that let me go look that case up let me go tell you know this tribal member or this tribal leader, you know that there was a case that was won because of you know fighting for their rights and and what is in the laws, so it's important that we uh, we share this information. We have um, a comment on Facebook uh, from Ade Briands. Oh, I just call it hi, Ade. Oh, <laughs> I said hi, it Day. right, Ade Briands. <laughs> so she says, Josephine, you keep talking about economics. I think Shinnecock is in the belly of the beast, the heart of American capitalism, next to some of the masters of capitalism who sprawl their entitlement over all Shinnecock land. You speak truth. And then she says, how much is Shinnecock looking for to restart the oyster farm? Um, that I'll have to ask the head of the environmental department. <laughs> but I can find that out and tell a day I will hit her up. And we'll definitely Hello. share those those as, as you let us know. And if you have like a GoFundMe or a non for profit to donate to, we will definitely support you across uh, Literally from, we have Canada to literally Chile. This is like- <laughs> that's, UN that's great. I will definitely be on the phone tomorrow. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And, and then we have Carice Gulo. Oh, you. sorry. And I just said, I will get that information to, you know, to you and to- um, I got lost. To find out, you know, who- I don't know how to get- Sorry about that. Yeah, definitely. We'll help you out. We'll, we'll promote it all over First Foods on all of our networks and we'll make sure that we get your oyster hatchery back and running. Um, you know, that's, that's some, Siobhan will be glad to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. And she travels all over to these conferences and all, you know, she's gone all over the country to, to conferences on, on the environment and, and that. You know, she's headed up. Um, we started a, a community garden uh, years ago with our youth council, and then it's gone through different ones helping to, you know, make it grow, and then it will slow down, and now it's back, and we have our health and wellness department. So I think now we're, we're trying to get more departments to be able to uh, write funds or write it into their, their funding sources um, because that's, that's that food sovereignty. You know, having that community garden and having more people participate and then having um, workers go and help others um, to have a small garden in their home rather than just if, you know, you don't want to come down to the community garden. There's one program, you have tribal programs and then you have other programs um, that are helping everyone to to try to work towards the, uh, the food sovereignty and gardening, farming again. So we have just two more comments, one from the Zoom group and one from the Facebook, and I'll read them off and then I'm gonna open it up for any last minute questions. We have like about five or six minutes okay. uh, for the program, but Carice Gulo, uh, she says, thanks for sharing, Josephine. It's good to see your face. Love slump. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Carice. I love you and miss you. No power for us to work next to each other this year. <laughs> Carice is a great cook. Great chef. Yep. We miss her in New York. She's definitely really good at making food. Yes. Um, so then we have Travis uh, Horse Ankles from the Zoom says, coming from the Great Plains, I am so excited to hear about your nation and what it means to live as a coastal tribe on the East Coast. So many of us can't even comprehend what that's like. Thank you for so much of for educating us. We All we see out here is grass. <laughs> <laughs> your food sources sound so bountiful and it's so beautiful that all you have um that you all have continuity in your identity through your food culture thank you thank you 
And again, it's sharing and seeing the similarities. You know, we have, um, Christina was talking about the, the pit where they were cooking the meat. And I remember going to, uh, to ceremonies out in, in South Dakota and how they cook the, the buffalo in a pit and, and we cook our foods also. We do a clam bake um, or lobster bake and we dig a pit and we build a fire and get the rocks hot. And then we gather seaweed and put the seaweed on the rocks. And then we put down the shellfish and the clams and the lobsters and the mussels and whatever shellfish and fish you gather and corn um, and potatoes. And then we cover that over with a, a, a tarp and let that, that cook in that pit, um, that clam bake pit. So it's, um, it's good good uh, good foods all around in all cultures well I thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of of this uh, green feather and, and first foods uh, program here it's um, it's been enlightening it's been um, you know I'm just glad that Somebody had reached out. I'm sorry a person that was supposed to be here couldn't come, but I'm glad I was able to sub in and, and we've had some uh, nice uh, commentary going back and forth, good comments and all. So um, thank you for your services of what you're trying to do with your programs um, and um, just good, uh, good luck to everyone that, that's fighting for um, their their food safety, their food sovereignty, their food sustainability. Um, you know, so it, it's just important that we just keep uh, having the knowledge of of one another and being able to to share that and and work towards uh, keeping this place and keeping what is necessary and healthy and healing. Food is healing. Everybody gathers around food. You can be at a fight in a meeting, but you have a you know a feast there, a, a table, a potluck set out, and everybody's willing to you know you get to talk a little bit. So there's so much regarding food, you know how it can bring people together. You know you have food, you have a repast after after a, a funeral, um, you know, that, that brings people together again, and allows you to, to speak about things and you get to see people you haven't seen when you have a feast. And we, you know, have feasts at powwows or feasts in, in your homes for different events and everything. We have our none of us, we have our, our different Thanksgivings throughout the year. So, um, you know, food is important. Food is important, not just to, to eat, not just for that, that uh, bodily um, uh, strength, but it's important for our spiritual um, well-being as well. All right. Well, are there any other questions or comments? Otherwise, you know, we'll wrap it up. This has been just such a wonderful class. Thank you, Josephine, um, for coming on and for sharing, I mean, a wealth of knowledge. I know I just soaked up your whole class like a little sponge over here. I need to stop doing first foods before dinner because my stomach is growling. You're talking about all these <laughs> So thank you for coming on. Um, thank you to our partner, Ibex Puppetry, for the support to make it happen. And thank you for everyone who continues to come on these, on these classes and ask questions and participate. It really means a lot that you're here. So thank you for coming and we will see you next week. Same okay. time. Yes. Okay. Great. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice. Thank yeah. you, Josephine. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Josephine. Amazing, uh, amazing presentation. That was great. Thank you. Take care. I don't think I'll ever taste the uh, clam chowder again the same.
<laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna want Shinnecock homemade. Oh yeah, you do. Come on, if you're out east again, come to one of those other food sovereignty conferences, mm -hmm. and I'll have to make you up some. <laughs> I'm gonna have to adopt you as my auntie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eating good. <laughs> Yeah, I always feed people. That's so they know they can come to me for food. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Desiree. Appreciate it all. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.